Central Wisconsin. Oh, there you go. I'll start again. Welcome back to the Central Wisconsin agenda of uh, Wisconsin Water Week. Hope you all enjoyed your lunch. If you didn't like your lunch, talk to the management. Um, next session is what I've titled Collaboration Corner. And what we're going to be doing is hearing a couple of stories within the Wisconsin River Basin about groups working together for water quality. Uh, Old Plain Watershed intersects the Wisconsin River in southern Marathon County, just uh, around Knowlton, just south of Mosinine for your geographical location. Our first group is um, going to be Patrick Bula, John Kennedy, Brian Forrest, and Matt O'Megan. They're with the Old Plain Partnership for Integrated uh, conservation or EPIC formed in late 2017 as a way to help various conservation stakeholders in and around Old Plain Watershed to better collaborate and coordinate their efforts. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. All right, let me just share my screen here. I have a PowerPoint put together for this. While he's getting that loaded, can I just say it's Omekin, not Omegan? <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> um, so uh, thanks for being here today, everyone. As Scott mentioned, uh, we're all representatives of the Eau Plaine Partnership for Integrated Conservation. Um, and so we're here today to talk to you a little bit about what that partnership looks like and who the different stakeholders are in our group and how we're kind of creating a model as we've gone along for uh, community-led watershed protection in the Eau Plain. So to begin with, I think we can just round down the line and introduce each of our speakers here today. Uh, my name is Patrick Bula. I work for Marathon County as a conservation specialist. And I started just before uh, EPIC really formed back in late 2017. So I've been able to see the evolution of the group over that time, and I've been lucky enough to uh, be a part of helping them to uh, figure things out and begin putting uh, events together and uh, really getting things moving in the watershed. Um, so that's me. Um, Matt, do you maybe want to introduce yourself next? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Matthew Olmekin. I'm part owner of Short Lane Egg Supply. And you can see in my picture there that I love wearing shorts and I love flying drones. Um, I like, I, that's really interesting that that picture uh, keeps circulating. But I got part of Epic, what was that, 2018? I yeah. think it was. Yeah, because um, this uh, red-haired, bearded fella and a tall, uh, black-haired fella came up to me and said, hey, do you want to have a unique opportunity? And we made a pitch and we've been working with Epic ever since. And it's a great, it's a great uh, partnership too, because a lot of the things that we've always wanted to do more of with, not, with um, Farmers Acres overlaps with the goals that Epic is in. So it's, um, you know, being on the re retail side, a lot of people will say, well, do you feel like that's constrictive to your business model? Not at all, so. Thanks. Uh, and John, do you maybe want to introduce yourself next? Uh, sure. My name is John Kennedy. I'm the vice president of the Big Old Plain Citizens Organization and also founding member of, of EPIC. Um, we're at the receiving end of all the, uh, the, the nutrient-rich runoff in the Old Plain watershed and subject to a lot of uh, harmful wounds. And I just want to say that after... Oh, 10, 10, 12 years involving with, with BEPCO. For the first time, I have a kind of a positive feeling that we're going to be able to make an impact and actually do something about this uh, with, with the, uh, the way things are going with EPIC and just the way things are going with the last couple of years in terms of the runoff. It's actually has been last year and this year so far, I've actually been at quite, quite decent. You know, last year's uh, was a little bit of forced conservation on Mother Nature's part because of all the super, super wet that we had. Um, uh, so there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of ability for farmers to do their, 
their uh, fall tillage and heavy manure spreading and stuff was just too wet. And actually, the the, the summer the, the the results showed greatly in the water clarity tests. So, like I say, I, I'm I'm confident we're actually starting to make a little bit of progress. Thanks, John. And then last in line is Brian Forrest. Brian. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Brian Forrest, owner of Maple Ridge Dairy. Um, we, uh, we have about 3,800 acres that we farm. We have a dairy farm with uh, around uh, 1,900 cows and um, got involved with Epic right, right from the get-go back in 2017. And um, it just, it's great in central Wisconsin. You know, we've had, we've had groups around us, you know, in the, uh, the uh, um, sea of Wisconsin, the east and west and south. And, uh, you know, it's about time we get, we get something going here uh, in central Wisconsin. And uh, so, yeah. All right. Thanks, Brian. Uh, and next in line here, um, just kind of wanted to give a, a brief background of where we're coming from and how the group got together. And I've got some questions lined up uh, for our panel of EPIC representatives too here as we go along. Uh, but just to, to begin, Scott mentioned kind of where the O-Plane is, is based, but I think this map may give you a better idea. Uh, we're in central Wisconsin in Marathon County and specifically the western side of the county. On the right hand side of the screen, you can see the Eau Plaine watershed, the big Eau Plaine watershed outlined in black. Um, and this is kind of the, the center of our focus as a group. This is where we're really putting most of our effort. And it, it's interesting, I always include this map on presentations because it gives a, an, an idea of what it looks like on the ground in that watershed. This is a land use uh, map of what's happening in the Eau Plaine and Western Marathon County. Uh, as you can see, all of those uh, dark green features on there are uh, agricultural uh, land use areas. So that's land that's either under cropland or pasture land. Um, all in all, it makes up about 75% of the land area in the Eau Plaine. So agriculture really does dominate the landscape of the Eau Plain and most of Western Marathon County. And because of this, uh, a lot of our efforts with the group have really focused on uh, agricultural management practices and working with the farming community. Uh, as time goes on, we're trying to engage uh, non-farmers uh, more and more. Um, and that is a work in progress right now. Uh, so, also, what that agriculture actually looks like on the ground, just so you have an idea, is um, lots of livestock, which means that we're dealing with uh, lots of manure. Uh, we're also dealing with heavier soils, uh, so low infiltration, uh, low permeability rates. In the past, this has been dealt with uh, through uh, ditching and, and heavier tillage, but all of those things put together means that in a given year, there's a lot of potential for runoff to occur and for that runoff to enter uh, surface waters. And what this leads to are algal blooms and then potentially to uh, low dissolved oxygen levels and, and fish kills. So on the right hand side of the screen is actually a picture from 2009 uh, when there was a fish kill after dissolved oxygen levels dropped below one part per million in the Big Oak Plain Reservoir. Uh, so this is kind of the issue at hand. Um, and as all of this is happening in the watershed, uh, even leading up to 2009, there were a bunch of different individuals and organizations um, in the area in Western Marathon County and around Wisconsin that were concerned with the Oak Plain and we're actively working towards trying to improve the conditions there. So this is just a, a sampling of some of those organizations um, that were already out there and concerned with the watershed. Uh, but in 2017, it was recognized that all of these different folks had pretty similar goals. They're working towards the, the same idea. And uh, 
and with a lot of help from UW Extension, Chris Stiles, uh, we're able to pull some of these uh, different individuals together and begin brainstorming about ways that we could cooperate uh, and, and coordinate efforts. Uh, as you can see, there's no small feat. Uh, there's a wide variety of folks that were brought to those first meetings and, and more have been added since. Uh, but since the beginning, it's ranged from individual farmers like, like Brian to uh, BEPCO members uh, like John and quite a few other organizations in between, uh, government entities, nonprofits, uh, lots of diversity. And so the challenge, an initial challenge in my opinion was bringing all of those different voices together to find common ground and, and establish a, a common goal. I don't know, Brian or John or Matt, do you have anything else that you'd like to add to that from your experience? Well, I, I would just say that, um, you know, the, the, the part that, that really interests me in Epic is the, uh, is farmers, farmers with farm, farmers. We have peer group meetings and we can talk about practices and, and um, uh, that's really what gets my blood pumping. But I would also say that with, with uh, our group being, um, having all these other uh, um, uh, partners in it, it, there's a bit of, uh, of accountability and, um, and just being on the same page with, with all these stakeholder groups that you can see on your screen right now. And I think it, it, it really, it, it, it helps our group. Uh, so. Thanks. You know, and going off of like what Brian just said there, you know, keeping, keeping on par and in touch with everybody else. When you have a diverse array of all these different perspectives, all these different narratives. A lot of times people would say that maybe that causes too much friction. You know, for instance, what would a farmer have to do with a nonprofit organization on environmentalism, like with, with River Alliance? But when you go through all the noise, you actually find out that River Alliance and farmers have overlapping, and I like using that term, goals in mind. And you just find out that when you work together, you actually can fast track a lot of accomplishments um, and a lot of goals that each, um, you know, each group wants to have. So like when we have this, this group, it's not like their side, our side, it's uh, what our goals are. And it's, um, it's a great model. And that's why I always like to tell people that this is, we're the most diversified and largest watershed uh, group and not even farmer led it's a uh, community led because at the end of the day that's what it's all about you know it's not just you know supporting the farmer but it's also helping support the rural communities and the natural resources as well thanks guys and so i, I mentioned that chris tiles played no small part in bringing everyone together and this is some of the work that we were doing in those initial meetings is um, it, going through exercises uh, that UW Extension helped put together to, to really figure out, well, where does this common ground exist uh, between all of these different stakeholders, this, this diversity of, um, of groups. And, and so on the right hand side, uh, this is a logic model that, that we ended up putting together for uh, some short-term, medium-term, and, and long-term outcomes that we really want to see from uh, the establishment of a group like Epic. Like Epic. Um, but it was it was a bit of a process. Um, uh, one of the questions we were asked to address was, were there hurdles to, to getting formed? Um, and I, I, I don't know if it's really a hurdle, but I think that there's some challenge to bring together a diversity of opinions and trying to, to get everyone on the same page. And Brian, Matt, uh, John, I, do you have anything to, to say about that? Hurdles to getting epic form? I was more on like, on the, like it was already there when um, I showed up, but I would say that one hurdle was stepping out of the comfort levels that made 
um, some of these impacts that conventional farming has caused. Uh, that was uh, probably a challenge. And I would even say that for, for me as well, because, you know, you grow up understanding certain practices of, of managing acres. And when you adopt trying to do different things and somebody offers you like, hey, I need you to wear another hat. Sometimes people get a little nervous. They get a little flustered to wear that hat or they feel they need to wear different hats. Like I interact this way at this organization, I got to do it differently. But mm -hmm. that, that always pulls a challenge. But once you, you break out of that, then I think it gets a little bit easier. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. And um, I guess when you mentioned that, it made me think too, here on the screen, we have four qualities that we've asked from the beginning that all members uh, really embody um, in, in their interactions with Epic. And that is being open-minded and willing to explore new ideas, interested in finding solutions, not just defending the status quo, uh, being willing to listen to other people that are in the group so that you can find common ground uh, between all of these different voices. And then finally being able to provide uh, just positive feedback so that we're able to find real solutions to, to the problems that we're all trying to address. And, and I think that that's been foundational in, in how the group has operated over the past few years. Yeah, I would say, you know, in, in the beginning, you know, when one of our stakeholders in our group is governmental agencies, that that's like, oh, if you're a farmer, oh boy, you know. And um, but but it's been it's 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 not that at all. You know, it's it's not anybody telling us how to farm. It it's it's uh, you know farmers telling you know sharing what we can do to change our practices. We're the ones who are in the driver's seat, and uh, because you know, we, we pretty well know what we're doing. And um, so it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. And out of those first meetings, I, I always like this mission statement. I think it's significant um, in that it, it really brings together all the different interests of these different stakeholders and I think puts everyone on the same page. This is something that we can all work towards regardless of whether or not we're uh, farmers or um, uh, uh, lakeshore owners or uh, any number of uh, other roles we might have in between, uh, but integrating resilience into the natural resources, community and economy of the Eau Plaine watershed. Uh, that's EPIC's mission statement that was developed after those first few meetings and um, that, that work that Chris Stiles helped us go through early on. So another question that was asked of us was what are some of the major projects, successes, benefits that Epic and all of our partners are, are most proud of? And I just threw up some photos here that I know we've used over the past few years, but in my mind, these are these are some big successes uh, that Epic's been able to put out there. I have a photo on the top right hand side of Common Ground, an annual event where we're able to bring stakeholders from once again a bunch of uh, different places together to discuss uh, these issues and discuss how Epic is addressing them. Uh, in the middle there I have a picture of John Kennedy. Uh, he's uh, addressing a group at uh, a BEPCO um, a, a BEPCO event that we had on the reservoir, uh, just talking about water quality in the reservoir. Uh, and we we're able to bring farmers out to that. So bringing farmers and uh, shoreland owners together for an event like that is a big deal. Uh, the peer groups that Brian mentioned, there's a photo of one on the top left, field days, uh, Matt O'Mekin hosting a field day on the bottom left. Uh, and we've just been doing a lot of these kind of education and outreach events and trying to network these different groups together. Um, that, those are just what jumped to my mind, but uh, do you guys have anything in particular that, that you really view as a success of the group? <laughs> I always wait to make sure I'm not the first one talking, but um, sometimes I just can't help myself. So. I feel that when we have these field days, 
we're offering something that gives a uniqueness and uh, growers feel like they're getting a learning opportunity at these field days. So it's not that when they come to these, they're like, okay, you're gonna talk about soil erosion. We actually get into the nuts and bolts of the functionality of landscape management and how that relates to your logistics and your profitability of farming operations. And, you know, growing up, you know, as my dad, when I was, my dad started this company since I was two. So I've seen a lot of like field days where it's like, here's some corn, here's some beans. When you can offer stuff like this, where you're just like, look at this system, what we were able to do, there's just so much diversity with that. And it's, uh, those have been really, really great. Um, and I especially like that one in the corner there with, with Jason, when we had that uh, group of people for that one. Um, that was a really special day where we kind of did a round tour. And kind of like what Brian was saying is, it's not that, uh, it's not that uh, farmers are doing things wrong, it's just that nobody's, seeing all the good stuff that they are doing and these are those chances of us doing those things yeah i would just uh echo what matt said and, and in that upper left hand picture there are our uh, peer group meetings there there's there's nothing like getting getting farmers together and and you can see you know you know the you can see their fields you drive by them all all your life and and here we are actually getting into the details of what they're doing um and and there's there's so much to it and and you can't say oh that's done over over in uh you know down by madison where they have you know they have a longer growing season or over where they have sandier soils no it's farmers right here that are doing it and you're you're right there with them asking the questions and and um there's just nothing better than that yeah absolutely and um yeah, and those they fluctuate. Sometimes we'll have these very we'll have these more smaller ones where it'll be like five of us. Well, that's nice because then that gives you a different level of interaction because then those would be like, well, what are some things to push the envelope? And then we'll have farmer peer meetings where we bring in some new people, and then that gives a chance for one the seasoned guys like your Brian's, your Tom's, Pete's, the more seasoned guys to showcase their skill set and how well they can translate and educate these kind this kind of information to to the new one. So that's they're very dynamic and it's uh, that's really cool too. And you know, let's not forget like the whole common ground thing in that upper right hand corner as well. That um I remember the first time we went to those, that was when we were like fresh and new with Epic and that it was just tickled pink by that. You had such a diverse array of different people there. And then even my older brother, Craig commented, he's, that he said that it was so interesting because he said you would go from talking to somebody who's doing a honeybee project and then you would look over and you would meet a grazer. And then you would look down and then you would see somebody that traveled out of the state that would be a potential you know, stakeholder or somebody who has legislative ties. And it all was happening in that little, in that little room there. And it was, uh, it was just, Yeah, thanks guys. Patrick, oh. you got about Patrick, you got about mm -hmm. five. All okay. right, perfect. That, you, that works about right then. Um, so then uh, one of the last questions we were asked to address is uh, what are some of the most significant opportunities or benefits that have really come about by partnering with these different organizations, bringing everyone to the same table? And once again, I, I just threw on some images here that I thought um, really spoke to that, uh, the, the benefit of bringing different organizations together. And so here on the left-hand side of the screen uh, is a, a picture from our signage project with the group. And so you can see we have agricultural signs for, for no-till, cover crops, managed grazing. But at the same time, uh, we also have, I mean, signage for healthy shorelines. And I think that this gets back to the point of everyone has something in this game. I mean, uh, whether or not you're a farmer or a shoreline owner, you, you want to see water quality improve. You want to see soil health improve. Farmers want to, to lose topsoil and nutrients about as much as shoreline owners want to see uh, surface waters uh, polluted by them. Um, and so, 
I think it's cool that here in this one organization, we're able to promote both of these things and have members that, um, that, that help us to do so. On the right hand side of the screen here too, uh, Matt mentioned earlier on the Clearwater Farms program and a, a group like Epic has helped to create opportunities for an organization like River Alliance and uh, a farm like uh, Miltrums to come together uh, for a program like Clearwater Farms. Uh, so I think there's this untapped potential out there uh, for these different kind of organizations to partner in ways that we haven't really considered before. Um, and then once again, on the bottom right hand side of the screen, I mean, uh, that's a, an image from a meeting that we had with our local environmental resources committee, but EPIC helped to put that together. So here's a group with representatives from all different walks of life coming together to help hopefully influence uh, local policy. Um, but those are things that jump to my mind. Uh, Brian, John, Matt, you guys have have anything more to add? No, it was a good explanation. Yeah. Well, great. And th that's all I have for the PowerPoint here. But before we end, I know we might have a few minutes left. Is there anything else that, that you guys, Brian, John, Matt, uh, think is significant um that that people should know about in regards to epic and community-led watershed protection um i mean like talking about ourselves or just like the the importance of of community watershed group in general yeah, i think that yeah the importance of community-led watershed uh, groups in general <laughs> i would say the biggest in uh, the biggest uh difference in the significance i would say of having something like that is there's a lot of static that all of a sudden just disappears because when you're bringing everybody together and it's a collective movement you you curtail a lot of like uh disagreements and then all of a sudden the the functionality and your goals of what you want to aspire to accomplish all of a sudden get fast tracked exponentially that's the one thing that i learned um with when you're bringing in all these different entities and i even you know even at our meetings like when we're brainstorming like well, what can we do for like an upcoming event if we wanted to sit down event or if we wanted to propose topics you we literally have some like a voice from every major kind of i think we lost you matt so i think we lost matt um uh oh do either brian or john have any final input? Uh, I just wanted to say that with with Epic and, and for those that are thinking of starting another group like this, uh, diversity is definitely uh, a big factor, especially among our farmers. You know, we had uh, with our farmers groups, we had everything from, we have a, uh, an organic farm that is pure grazing. Um, you know, he, he can't do the the no-till stuff, you can't do a lot of the stuff that, that because of his organic certification, he's a little bit tricky there. We've got some that were, were very involved in, in the, uh, the, the, the no-till and cover crops, and we have some that were just starting into it. And it's important to, to keep a diversity and have, rather than having everybody that's, that's totally signed on and full tilt, full tilt uh, on, it's good to have some that were, that were just starting to embrace the, the, the practices. Yeah, um, I'm just I'm just so grateful that we have a group because um, it, it just helps organize um, these efforts. Uh, if, if you didn't have that, we we could meet as farmers. We could, you know, it just, just too so haphazard, and and this gives it organization so that we can kind of track things a bit, know where we've been, know you know have goals set to where we're going, and and uh, that's really helpful. You know, even as even just having our, our peer group meetings and somebody there to help help so that everybody can talk and organize that so we get get more out of them out of that time. So yeah. Anyway. Great gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for that. 
insight into your group. Uh, just uh, I got a couple questions, but I'd like to just uh, get one of them here. And if we have time at the end, we'll get back to those. But um, a question that's going to the top of the heap here is, what percentage of the watershed landowners are in your group? Does anybody want to tackle that one? So that, that's difficult to answer in our case because we, we don't have a formal membership per se. What we have are an advisory panel, uh, which consists of about 30 individuals. Uh, they help to steer the actions that we take as a group. And then we just have generally uh, farmers and, and other landowners that are involved with the group, but there's no formality to that membership. So it's not like we have membership lists. Like, I mean, we have mailing lists that we use to reach out to people that are interested in events, but um, beyond that, it's, it's hard to say exactly what percentage of the watershed is actually directly involved with EPIC. You're all coming to the table for the same goal. It's, that's what you want. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. And if you can hang on for the end, we can maybe get to some more questions. But we'd like to transition. Uh, again, thank you, Patrick, John, and Brian, and Matt for your uh, presentation today. And we'd like to transition over to uh, our next presenter. I've had the privilege to be in the passenger seat for past several years to the, our next presenter. Rick Georgeson is the past president of Packers and has attended many farm workshops organized for the Mill Creek farmers. His presentation will highlight these many farm visits. And as he states, I quote, I'm inspired when I find lake people and agriculture are able to work together to explore new solutions. In this session, we hope you will meet John Aaron. He's the lead farmer of the Mill Creek Farmer-Led Council. John was also the recipient of the 2020 Wisconsin Aldo Leopold Conservation Award. Again, just for uh, your geography people out there, the Mill Creek watershed is located west of Stevens Point where it intersects the Wisconsin River. Rick, I'll turn the floor over to you. Rick, you'll have to unmute. Thank you for that reminder. I want to welcome all those participants who are watching our session today. Uh, we have a fun story to tell, and it was very interesting to hear about EPIC. So I'm going to begin. Um, and I might need a little help here. I My slide. Can't advance my slides. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to come back to try this. There we go. Okay, I'm with actually a, sorry, Rick, you'll have to reshare again. We're not seeing your presentation. Oh, okay. All right, help me find that share button again. Lower part, there should be, it should be a green button that says share screen. Right there, okay. All right, there's my slides up, but I can't get it to go back to the beginning. Try clicking on the very first slide in the upper left corner. And then. There we, okay, now let's try this. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. And then try the down arrow to change slides on your keyboard. Right. There you okay. go. Uh, I'm, I'm with Pete and Will at Castle Rock Stewards, known as Packers, a nonprofit citizen group that formed in 2007 organized to improve the water quality of Pete Wall and Castle Rock. And we're currently just slightly over 200 members. And I'd like to thank 
the many technical advisors that have helped us over the years, DNR, County Conservationists, River Alliance, UW Extension, and many more. On the left, you'll see Pete and Well. On the right, Castle Rock, the second and fifth largest lakes in Wisconsin. And from this satellite view, you can see the algae already forming in early June. In 2008, we invited the politicians to come to the, uh, the lake to see firsthand what the issue was all about. And we wanted to ask them to see if there was any help that they could give us. So we, we took these politicians out on the water and uh, we had several boats and uh, they, could, uh, they could easily see and, and smell the issue and we had some great conversations on board. I wanna point out the, the shoreline in this particular slide because we'll refer to it later. 90% uh, of the shoreline of Petenwall and Castle Rock has a 100 foot buffer. So the, the mowed lawns do not meet the water except for in very, very rare cases. Pontoons and poly, the, the politicians reminded us that what would be a really a good act, uh, action for us to take is see if we could link other citizen groups from uh, up and down the river to come together so we could kind of create, you might say, a, a stronger voice. And so we did just that. We've got citizens from uh, Rhinelander to, to uh, Lodi and BEPCO and EPIC is considered part of that group. This is a slide that's, oh, by the way, uh, when we had the pontoons and politics, the result of that effort was uh, about three quarters of a million dollars came out of the state budget to fund the cost of a TMDL that was done and accomplished by the DNR. And that TMDL, which was a water quality study, was completed about a year ago and appro approved by the EPA a year ago. And this slide right here is is uh, to show you just a little part of the watershed. And I'm gonna share with you that that TMDL whoop, indicates what the TMDL does. For example, this is Mill Creek that runs from Marshfield to the Wisconsin River. The TMDL indicated that there was 175 parts per million of phosphorus entering the Wisconsin River at that point. And so the TMDL has given us that information from the major tributaries all along the Wisconsin River. So we have the numbers that's referred to as the science that's driving this whole project forward. So in 2016, with the help of many different partners, we pulled together a workshop, which we called Healthy Soil, Healthy Water. We had 130 people attend and half of the group was farmers. And we were very, very happy about that. We had 65 farmers in the room for the day. And we had some really great presentations done not only by the farmers, but by some other groups. We had some good speakers and the motivation of the day was uh, really terrific. Uh, we, we were sharing some of the concerns and, and uh, it resulted in two takeaways. One, I had one farmer, John Aaron, tell me, you bring the lake users to the farm, I'll bring the farmers to the lake. <laughs> and another farmer indicated, we aren't the problem, but we are the solution. So it was really a sign that looked like we were going to be able to create some synergy between all these folks. So we took the invitation up by John and went up to um, uh, his farm in uh, June of that year, toured the farm and many different features were pointed out to us. Here's a shot of, uh, of us in the hay field and John is talking about uh, some details that he was doing. I think one of them there was, was uh, to mow the, the hay a little bit taller than he had been in the past and that left a little bit of stubble for the pollinators. 
And we drove by this uh, field uh, on the left here, this cornfield that has got two signs indicating to the left, uh, no-till practice was used when that corn was planted. And to the right, conventional means were used when that plant was corn, that corn was planted. And as you can see, you can't tell any difference from one half to the other. It was pretty powerful to indicate that, you know, to go no-till seemed to be working at least up to this point. The slide on the right is uh, retention ponds that John dug at the foot of one of his huge cornfields. It kind of lies on a slope. And up until he put those re retention ponds in, runoff from those cornfields would just run down into a ditch and would eventually make its way to Mill Creek. Well, these retention ponds capture that runoff and uh, at certain times of the year when he needs water, he pumps water out of them and irrigates the field. So this was the beginning of the lake citizens working with the farmers. So a couple months later that year, the farmers were all invited to the lake. And uh, we had some terrific discussions. We uh, had a couple presentations from both, both parties. We had lunch together. The farmers shared that uh, there's pressure to produce food at low cost. Uh, there was a need for some grant money to help fund farmer-led groups. Uh, there was a real big desire for on both sides that we could try and create some some wholeness out of this group of folks and we could continue working together. The farmers were impressed by the 100 foot buffer strip that I had mentioned a little bit earlier. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the farmers called on his way home that afternoon, he called from his van. He said, I've got five farmers with me and uh, we we're just talking about that buffer strip that you featured down there at the lake. And it was stated that if you can have a buffer strip around the lake, we should be thinking about buffer strips along the creek. So we went out by boat with some of the farmers who were interested and took a tour and had some nice conversations on the boat. It was beginning to build that trust that you kind of look for. And uh, farmers were very grateful for the day and on the water. And uh, some of them even talked about returning to come fishing. So we went back up to the farm then in December of that year and we took a look at what they're trying to do in terms of trying some cover crop for the first time. Well, maybe it wasn't the first time, but it was to us. So here we have in the slide on the right, uh, uh, Ken, Ken Schrader, who is the spokesperson for the group and he kind of organizes the day. Uh, he's talking to us about these various plots of cover crop and they're looking for which ones might be the best to use in this part of the state. And here we have Shane Wooperfenig, our Wood County conservationist. He, he went into one of the fields of cover crop and pulled up to see, to show us what it was. Well, this was a tillage radish. So we get to see that it's a real growing uh, thing. And, and uh, so then we go back up to the farm in the summer in the next June and Ken Schrader here is demonstrating the use of a rainfall simulator which uh, was just really something to see. You really can learn quickly um, the advantage of uh, no-till. And I will just point out that uh, in the slide on the right, the jug on the right, that's got the brown water in the jug about half full. When the rainfall simulator was sprinkled two inches of water on those five plots of soil, that particular plot of soil ran a lot, most of the water ran off and filled that jug. That's an example of how it ran off that soil. And that soil was taken from a field that was conventionally tilled. Two jugs over, and the slide on the right, you'll see the jug is almost totally empty. And that jug, uh, the water did not slide off, the water did not run off the, the soil from the sprinkler, but rather it infiltrated through the soil and collected in the jug that's in the back that you could see if you look hard, you could see and most of the water is in that jug in the back. And that, that shows that with um, uh, no-till fields, you get increased infiltration. 
Then on to a soybean field where soybeans were planted into last year's corn stalks. And we're standing between the rows, we're standing on last year's corn stalks that were left laying. And the farmer planted right into them, did not till. Perfect example of no-till field. I asked that farmer at the end of his talk what inspired him to do this. And he said, you read about it in all the journals. He just thought he'd give it a try. And he says, I'll never go back. This works so well. In the slide on the right, we saw a demonstration of a piece of equipment that's used to overseed uh, cover crop seed uh, in standing corn. And, 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 and this field right here where we're spreading that cover crop seed, we come back to that very field in December and we remove the snow with the shovels and the brooms to see that yes, indeed, that cover crop did take. Back on the bus down the road a little bit, we stopped at a, a, a monitoring site on Mill Creek and we had along board on this trip, a Scott Provost from the DNR and he's telling us how they monitor at this site on Mill Creek. Riding the bus from one spot to the other is always kind of fun in that uh, I, I try and make it a point to, to sit with somebody that I don't know, take advantage of that 10 or 15 minute ride, introduce myself, have that person introduce them to me and I ask them how this is employed on their farm, what are they learning, are they interested, and it, it creates some real good conversations. And when we got to the next stop, we were to, to see the demonstration of a low disturbance manure injector uh, where, where the hose uh, leading to the back of this machine, for those of you that might not know, this has got liquid manure that's coming out of the manure pit, which I believe in this case was a mile up the road. And, uh, and, and it's, being, it's coming into this unit and this unit digs trenches with the discs into the soil and the manure is placed several inches under the soil and the soil is uh, covered back up. So it, it gets the, the nutrients down into the earth. So there's very little chance of runoff. In the last demonstration, uh, most recent this fat past fall was a demonstration of the use of a drone that was used to sow cover crop seed over a field. Uh, Wood County Conservationist Shane came up with a really a neat idea that Pat Packers has supported uh, two, uh, two ideas. Uh, he wanted to purchase a no-till drill that he owns, the county owns. Packers put $2,000 into that drill and efforts are now in place to do the same thing for a roller crimper. And this equipment is then rented out to farmers who want to give this a try on their farm. And for viewers, uh, I might explain a little bit what's taking place over here. <clears throat> this is cover crop that in this case got pretty tall. Now let's say this is the first uh, late May or so uh, and rather than, uh, so what this roller crimper does is it pushes it down, crimps it right, lays it right flat on the ground. And in the same pass, the farmer's pulling, <coughs> excuse me, pulling the no-till drill. So one pass, he takes care of the cover crop and, and the seeds at the same time. We are awarding farmers who are taking these steps to make these changes on their farm. And uh, in this case, we awarded uh, John Aaron with uh, outstanding Land and Water Conservation uh, Award that uh, Packers gives. We did so also with the Wallendahl Farm in Adams County. In this fall, our most recent uh, was awarded to the Roth Brothers Golden Acres. John and his wife, Melissa, do on occasion with their son, Jack, and their daughter, Nora, come down and enjoy a day on the water. And I'd like to extend congratulations to John and Melissa for the, uh, uh, the Aldo Leopold. They were the recipients of this year's Aldo Leopold Award. Bringing the partners together, trying to figure it out. And it's been fun being some of the partners. One of my favorite quotes, never doubt 
that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world, for indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And uh, leave some contact information up for anyone who may want to make contact. And I certainly would welcome any of those. And at this point, I might mention I was, the intention was to introduce John Aaron, but he had some issues with this high wind on his farm today. And he called earlier this morning and said, I'm going to try and make it, but if I don't get there, you'll know why. And I told him I'd carry the weight. And that, that concludes my presentation. Very good, Rick. Thank you. I'm um, going to go back to a couple questions. Uh, again, type any questions in. But I got a couple of questions. It looks geared more towards the first presentation. And I guess I can kind of combine two of these into one question. But um, they're asking about how, how do you let people know about your successes? How do the farmers let uh, other people know their successes? And um, have you created any videos showing your successes? And again, that's directed to uh, Patrick's group. Yeah, um, to that last point, as far as videos that have been created, I, I know Matt just correct messaged me. He had to step away from the computer for a minute to take care of some business. But um, he has been responsible for putting together some great videos over the past couple of years since he's been involved with the group and has helped us to set up a YouTube channel. Uh, so actually, if you look on YouTube for Wisconsin Conservation, and you'll see the Epic logo with that, you can sample some of the videos that we have out there. And those have ranged from uh, virtual field days over this past year and some virtual events in lieu of uh, in-person events, but with COVID, to uh, um, just some cool recordings, cool drone footage of uh, some practices that have been going on out in the field and shoreland protection work. So we have those out there right now. And we also try and work with uh, local uh, papers as well. Um, uh, Ag Review, we've been featured in Ag Review a number of times and uh, Record Review, I believe, as well as also done some stories on Epic. Um, and then also just going out of our way to try and touch base with as many different um, groups as possible has been to our benefit. Uh, River Alliance, I know that um, their social network or their social media um, ha has definitely helped us out quite a bit. So uh, when we have a success story up here, oftentimes River Alliance will be sharing that with their audience. Um, that, and that is quite a bit larger than our own. So um, that's, yeah, that's uh, one of the benefits of having a diverse partnership. Yep, great. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, another question for you, um, talking about the large collaboration. Did, did your group start big or did it grow over time? And then um, if it was all inclusive from the beginning, was that helpful or was that challenging on, on sizing? I guess is the question. Yeah, it, it's definitely grown over time. Um, uh, like I said, we don't have a, a formal membership, um, but what we do have are those mailing lists. And then we also do try and survey farmers uh, each year to see who's involved with Epic, who's coming out to meetings, and, and what impact our, our education and outreach programs having on individuals. And so even though we've only been around for a few years, we've seen an exponential increase in the number of people um, that have been engaged by the group and are participating in surveys. And I anticipate that that will continue going forward. Um, so even though we just literally started out with um, not even 30 individuals at the beginning of the mm -hmm. first advisory panel meeting, we've, we've definitely grown over time um, and, and rapidly. Uh, as far as the, the challenges associated with diversity, um, I'd say it was a strength early on, um, really, uh, like we mentioned in our presentation, it allowed us from the outset to create a, a mission and, and a message that appealed to all 
different sorts of people instead of um, uh, just maybe the farming community alone or uh, lake owners alone. We're able to bring all of those individuals together. Um, I, I think it was important starting out, um, you might've seen in the slideshow that we had those four qualities listed. It was important that uh, we, we brought together people that really did embody those qualities. Uh, if, if, if we hadn't, then it might've been more difficult than it was, but because everyone sitting at the table had mm -hmm. some understanding of what we were asking of them and, and what was required of them as being part of that group, it went smoothly. Good, thanks. Um, Rick, question regarding total phosphorus from Mill Creek. It says, has that been reduced? I'm not sure we have any definite on that or can you comment on that? That is a very good question and, and I do not have information on that. Okay, and then a uh, question I'll just throw out there for anybody who wants to take a stab at it. What can citizens group do or say to help farmers know that we want to work with them and not in opposition to them? I think the main uh, thing to keep in mind is that we want to get to know them. We want to partner with them and we want to learn about what they're doing. Uh, we are not here to tell them what to do, but rather to try and encourage them to come on board with other farmers to exchange ideas. And, that's, and I said that carefully because that's almost how careful you need to keep in mind you know, I mean, when you're trying to make a new friend, you want to keep in mind you're trying to make a new friend. <laughs> and I would say, go, go ahead, Brian. I would just say from a farmer's perspective that we, you know, for the most part, farmers are very independent. That's a lot of times why they are farming and they, they you got to be careful because they, they, they're farming because they don't want to be told what to do a lot of, in a lot of cases, but, but on the flip side, we love to talk about what we do when we feel comfortable and we like to always get better for the most part and, and change. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Uh, I just want to say that after meeting Rick at a lot of these events, he's got kind of a unique uh, way of doing things. When I go to an event, most of us try to go to our comfort zone, who, who we know, and we see people we recognize and try to go and, 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 and meet with those people. And, and Rick uh, was telling me uh, he, he deliberately seeks out somebody different to ride with on each part of a trip of a tour and diversity. And, and I think I just want to give hats off to Rick for that, that level of thoughtfulness that most of us uh, don't have. Well, well said, John. Yep. Most of the time you want to go to where it's easy. But, and, and, you know, to Brian's point, um, you know, as you mentioned before, um, they're in the driver's seat on, on, on how to get things done. So we, we got to listen to them as well. It's just, it, you can't, there can't be any sort of pointing. It's got to be a collaborative, collaborative effort. So it looks like we have all the questions answered. Does anybody, uh, we have a minute left. Does anybody want to have a parting Comment? Matt, I'm just double checking the chat to make sure I got all the questions answered. It looks like I do. Again, thank you everyone for your participation today. Um, I'm sure it was well received. Uh, we now have a 15 minute break and then at 2.30 the keynote speaker Kiel Nelson will be uh, on board. Again, 